I was raised in a middle class family, working middle class family. My mother taught us, particularly my sister and I, uh, the sister next to me and I, that uh, we're African. All right. Uh, she made that a very important lesson for us. She said, you are African, you know, nobody call you nothing other than that, okay? So, and she brought us the culture, you know, she, she made us understand that. But at that time, as a young woman, she was involved in uh, an African dance class and that kind of thing. So me growing up, I always knew that I was an African child, okay? A child of, of Africa. And therefore, being called outside of my name, you know, the N word, and I don't like using the word, I don't like the word at all, and they use it crazy around these places these days. But being called that was, uh, those were fighting words. You know, in our house, we used to have pictures of Rat Brown, you know, Stokely Carmichael, Malcolm X. You know, so these individuals, these, these were icons, you know, in, in the household, you know, represent, you know what I mean? Represent this movement, right? So, you know, Martin and the whole bit. I'm tired of violence. I've seen too much of it. I've seen hate on the faces of too many sheriffs in the South. And I'm not going to let my oppressor dictate to me what method I must use. The, the, the assassination of Martin Luther King, that's one thing that impacts me. The, the other thing that really impacted me, uh, I think it was 1968 Olympics, when John Carlos and uh, Tommy Smith raised their fists in protest, that was significant. John Carlos used to be one of my math tutors. So the culture, the African culture and, and the politics and the, the, the time, you know, the struggle that was going on, the civil rights movement that was going on at that time, you know, being a, being a part of that and being impressed by that. Um, and then, the other hand, seeing the Black Panther Party taking this other stroke. After the death of Martin Luther King, after his assassination, I began to realize that maybe this nonviolent protest thing is not going to be all this is going to be in order to make real changes in this country. You are either free or you are a slave. There's no such thing as second class citizenship. The only politics in this country that's relevant to black people today is the politics of revolution. We don't hate nobody because of their color. We hate oppression. We hate murder of black people in our communities. We hate the gross unemployment that exists in our communities. We hate black men being taken off into the military service to be fighting for our greatest decade in American prominence as freedom. Now I saw Black Panther Party on TV, and I told my mom, it's right there. I said, Mom, I'm going to be one of them. I'm going to be a part of that. And she had a fit. She says, Zoom, people there, they ain't know what they're doing, so forth and so on. But I said, Mom, they fight for black people. She said, ah, they ain't, you know, she's on some other thing, you know, nonviolence, you know, that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, so she didn't, she didn't support that idea, but they had an impression upon me. And, uh, you know, during the summer, I used to come down, I used to always come over to the office, help out with distribution of the paper or certain kind of things that need to be done around the office, you know, hang out during the summer with the homies. But they want to get us off the streets. Why? Because J. Hoover says that the Black Panther Party is the greatest national security threat of the United States. And um, when the party split, a lot of people were sent to the underground, underground movement, right? And uh, essentially I was recruited into the underground. Efforts to struggle you know, uh, on that level has been since, you know, the day we came out off the boats. They brought us off the boats. We've always been in rebellion, you know, from the, from the slave rebellions, uh, uh, from plantations to the um, rebellions of Nat Turner, Denmark Vesey, Gabriel Proster, to the um, Revolutionary Action Movement, uh, and then naturally to the BPP and the BLA. You know, so there's always been that historical thread of resistance against white supremacy and racism.
And, uh, and when you recognize that, that, that thread of resistance um, throughout history, then you can see that there's always been that <clears throat> a movement, okay? No matter what name it took and time and place, right? There's always been those individuals who milit pers pers militantly pursue the ideals of freedom and liberation. The case of the New York Three, it originally was New York Five, okay? Uh, originally it was uh, two uh, Boricuan brothers, Francisco Torres and Gabriel Torres. May 19, 1971, uh, two um, police officers were wounded, okay? Uh, May 21st, 1971, two police officers were killed. Daruba bin Wahab in June was captured uh, for the May 19th event, okay? And come to find out 19 years later that he did not commit that, okay? August 28th, 1971, Noah and myself was captured in San Francisco and subsequently charged with the New York May 21st killing. The first trial was two trials. The first trial ended in a hung jury for the New York Five. All right. Um, the second trial, from which uh, when the jurors were to receive the case to deliberate, or a decision made uh, by the, the defense, the prosecutor and the judge, to dismiss the charges for Francisco and Gabriel Torres. Noah, myself, and Herman were convicted. When, when a judge sentences us, you know, he says that if these men are prisoners of war, then they have to recognize they're being captured by the enemy and they can expect what they're going to expect. That's the judge's sentencing statement. Yeah. He essentially said that we're prisoners of war. J. Edgar Hoover today characterized the Black Panthers as the most dangerous and violence prone of all the extremist groups now active in the United States. They know what happened with this case. They know what happened. Now that we've been convicted of this, now we have to prove our innocence. We're victims of COINTELPRO. All right? So while the United States has determined that the activities during that period of time um, where the Black Panther Party was a target of COINTELPRO and determined that the activities of the FBI was illegal and unconstitutional at that time, they have not established no remedies Right, they have established no redress for those who were victimized. All right, so now that's unfinished business. So I put out a call, basically a flyer, right, making a call for uh, Jericho 1998. And um, it was enthusiastically supported, uh, both inside and outside of prisons across the country. One of the reasons why we use the term Jericho because it's biblical. You know, it comes from uh, uh, the story of Joshua, you know, and when he surrounded the city of Jericho and the people marched and raised a clamor, you know, and the blowing of the trumpets to issue the, the new day, a new time, and the walls of Jericho came falling down. And, and basically what that means is that we are raising the noise, raising the clamor, the issues of human rights, until the wall of neglect and the lies of this not existing, you know, is torn down. So everybody will see, hey, 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 little push does exist in the United States. You know, every nation, every government, you know, has individuals who are quote unquote dissidents and have been incarcerated because of their political beliefs or their activities in regards to political, you know, political work, so forth and so on. So how can the United States, you know, deny, you know, that they have dissidents? Of course the United States have dissidents. Uh, we continue to argue that the question of